Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show here on Reason and Theology. On a Saturday, I want to go over uh, Ben Shapiro's recent comments about Pope Francis um, and whether or not he accurately understands Pope Francis. I want to offer some charitable interaction with some of the comments he has made about him. And, you know, this should come as no surprise to people that I like the Daily Wire. I enjoy their content. I might not agree with everything there, but I actually watch pretty much everybody at the Daily Wire. Uh, Matt Walsh, Mike Knowles, Candace Owens, uh, Ben Shapiro. I watch all of them. Um, I don't do a whole lot of YouTube watching, but whenever I view YouTube, it's actually Daily Wire uh, pretty often. And so I enjoy their content, love them. Don't always agree with their takes. You know, generally when Pope Francis comes up at the Daily Wire, I see some gaps in their information about Pope Francis. And I kind of hear a popular presentation and portrayal of Pope Francis that isn't very accurate. But I understand why they're saying that. And I used to hold the same views until I learned more about the issues um, surrounding Pope Francis. So I certainly get where they're coming from, but I think there might be some gaps and, you know, their, their perspective about Pope Francis, which again is understandable. And especially in light of the fact that a lot of these misunderstandings originate from Catholics and Catholic figures. Um, so I want to say that at the outset. Now, also, before I dive into the comments themselves, I've already seen a ton of people say, well, Ben Shapiro can't comment about the Pope because he's a Jew. That's a really bad argument. Um, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I can comment about Jewish figures. I can comment about Muslim leaders. I can, and I do. I can comment about anybody I want, right? It's it's perfectly fair to interact with non-Christians and to critique them, to recognize whatever good they may have, and then to critique whatever bad positions they may have. That's perfectly legitimate. And if that's legitimate for me as a Christian to do, and us as Christians to do, it's legitimate for him to also offer his opinion about the Pope. My only challenge would be, well, let's just make sure that our opinion is informed and accurate. So I don't have a problem with Ben Shapiro commenting about the Pope per se. I, I don't have an issue with that. Anybody can comment about the Pope. I just encourage them to make sure that you have your facts straight and you're accurate in your representation. That's all. Also, again, I've seen some really weird comments already saying things like, well, Ben is a Jew. And, and they'll just leave it at that, as if that's somehow an, an argument against anything that Ben said. Well, he's a Jew, as if that settles it. What do you mean by that? If, if you mean he practices Judaism, well, as I just established, he does still have a right to comment about non-Jews and interact with their theological perspective. That's perfectly legitimate because we can do that too. In fact, I'm offended whenever I do comment on issues related to Judaism and somebody attacks me and says that I can't. I think that's absurd. Of course I can comment on Judaism. Just as somebody who practices Judaism can comment on Christianity. We just need to be fair and charitable in our comments. That's all. That's the only required condition. Be accurate, be fair, be charitable. That's it. Um, but if somebody means, well, Ben is a Jew, as if that settles it, and they're talking about him ethnically, they're not just talking about his religion. Yeah, look, I, you know, I hate to break it to you, but Jesus was a Jew and still is a Jew because of the resurrection, right? I mean, he is alive and he still has a human body and it is a Jewish human body ethnically, right? He, he is of the seed of David. Um, so. You, you can't say, well, somebody is a Jew ethnically, as if that's a bad thing, and then seriously call yourself a Christian. Um, moreover, I'll say that just a reminder for people watching this video, I grew up in Israel. I practiced Judaism when I was a child. I've also experienced things in that context that most of y'all watching this will never experience, fortunately. And 
I'll say this. I don't tolerate those kinds of comments. So if you're going to come on this channel and start posting racist comments, you will immediately be blocked. I just want to be very clear about that. I'm not going to tolerate that. Having said that, let's maybe discuss his comments. I'm going to pull them up on my screen so we could take a look at them. Now, he has commented on Pope Francis elsewhere. Um, and I'm not going to do a comprehensive review of everything, you know, Ben Shapiro has ever said about Pope Francis. I'll just simply offer some comments on what we see here on Facebook. He really recently posted, it turns out that the American Catholics who are critical of Pope Francis are right. In essence, he's a liberation theologist who now occupies the office of the papacy. I saw people picking on his use of the term theologist. Um, accurately, actually, um, it, it is an accurate use. You, you can call someone a theologian or a theologist. So uh, there's, there's nothing to pick on there. Uh, he's a liberation theologist who now occupies the office of the papacy. And in a follow-up uh, comments in the same location, um, he says, and Catholics all over the world are very aware of the schism Pope Francis has now created within the Catholic Church because of his many overtures on social redistributionism and climate change. Ooh, a lot going on here. Wow. Um, let me just start at the outset before I tackle the specific points made here head on. Let me just say that I think this is a result of us Catholics poorly informing non-Christians about Pope Francis. I think that some of us are well-meaning Catholics, well-intentioned, but we're ignorant. We do not have all of the information. And so we have a distorted view. And unfortunately, we express our distorted opinions and incomplete opinions, and we do so publicly. And that ends up misleading non-Christians such as Ben Shapiro about Pope Francis. So ultimately, the errors that I think that Ben Shapiro is expressing here about Pope Francis, the inaccuracies and misunderstandings, I don't really blame Ben Shapiro for them. I don't really expect Ben Shapiro to be on the up and up about everything about Pope Francis. I do expect every individual who is going to comment on somebody to do their best to be informed, fully informed. But you can understand why someone like Ben Shapiro would have some misinformation due to the fact that so many Catholics have a distorted understanding of Pope Francis and are misrepresenting him and inaccurately portraying him. And that's going to factor in when someone who is a non-Christian, such as Ben Shapiro, from the outside, tries to look in. He's going to see this stuff and he's going to say, well, even Catholics are saying this, therefore it must be true. So I don't really blame Ben Shapiro for this misinformation as much as I blame Catholics. I'm going to hold the Catholics to a higher standard than Ben Shapiro here. You know why? Because they should know better and I expect them to know better and the information is available. Um, that being said, there are issues with Pope Francis. I've expressed them many times on this channel. If you want a balanced take on Pope Francis, just overall, I did a video called Pope Francis, the good and the bad. And I give you about a dozen bad things that exist with the pontificate of Pope Francis. Things that are I'm critical of. And I did my best to express those charitably and fairly to Pope Francis. But in accordance with Canon 212, I'm permitted to express some of those concerns. And I did. I gave you about a dozen. And believe me, I could give more. But I also gave about a dozen good things about Pope Francis that I think are sometimes overlooked. And um, highly encourage that everybody checks that out. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But if you just type in Pope Francis, the good and the bad. It'll come right up on YouTube. So I'm not going to give a comprehensive overview and a balanced, comprehensive take on Pope Francis here in this video since I would just be reinventing the wheel. But I will say this, though I'm, I'm going to be defending some things about Pope Francis here, that doesn't mean that there aren't other things that we could criticize about this pontificate elsewhere. I just keep that in mind. Uh, we need to be balanced here.
Um, but I do want to focus specifically on the misinformation and inaccurate portrayals of Pope Francis here. Okay, so the first thing is, is Pope Francis a liberation theologian? Now, in order to really answer that question, we first have to establish what is liberation theology. Um, believe it or not, there aren't a lot of great, concise treatments of what this means. Um, and that might also cause some of the confusion. But I actually did find a very good summary of it from Catholic Answers. And so I'll um, share my screen and we'll read through it together. Very, very short. Um, but before, you know, I engage his comments specifically, I want to make sure to read or to make sure to define our terms accurately, because if I just go on to critique what Shapiro said about liberation theology and we don't even define what liberation theology is, we're not going to get anywhere. All right, so somebody asks uh, Father Charles Grondon about liberation theology, and he says, Jesus taught us to love our neighbor as ourselves and to care for the poor. Liberation theology does much to bring those issues to the forefront. However, the problem with liberation theology is that it distorts the gospel message from one of salvation and transformation to mere social work. Bam! Spot on. Absolutely. One of the best summaries that you can find in one paragraph right there. There are a lot of things that liberation theologians rightly point to in the Gospels about the poor and the need to take care of the poor. There's a light of truth there, but what happens is they often use that theme as the overall theme for the entire message of Scripture, and that is the paradigm through which we read everything in the Bible. And that's inaccurate. However important care of the poor may be in Scripture, and it is important, um, it is not the central motif or way to understand Scripture and interpret Scripture. The best and most accurate way to read the Bible is to understand there is a problem with sin and there is a work of redemption initiated by God taking place here. God sees that we, through our own free will, have entered into rebellion against God, sin. We're doing things contrary to His will. We're pushing Him away. And that creates a problem and barrier between us and God due to the fact that God is holy and just. God is holy, which means he is not infected by sin. He is entirely distant from sin. He is holy. And he is just. He must punish sin and wrongdoers and evildoers. But obviously, God doesn't want to just leave us in our sin. Though he could, he doesn't. The motif of Scripture, the main paradigm through which you read it, is this work of redemption. The issue with the poor, poverty, that is a symptom of the problem. It's not the ultimate problem. What is the ultimate problem? Sin. Sin. If you take care of the sin issue, everything else will be fixed, including poverty. Now, that doesn't mean in the meantime, while we're tending to this sin issue, that we can't also tend to things like helping the poor and caring for the poor. It's a both and. We can do both. But what happens is the uh, liberation theologian sees everything through the lens of the poor and kind of puts the question of sin in the background and the work of redemption in the background. And rather, redemption isn't seen as redeeming us from sin through the crucifixion, life, death, and burial, and ascension, and resurrection of Jesus. It's more seen as, well, Jesus came to liberate us from oppressive captors. <laughs> There's a grain of truth to that. He came to liberate us from the oppressive captor of Satan and sin and bondage to sin. There's a grain of truth to it, but not necessarily he came to liberate us from oppressive governments who are suppressing the poor. That's a symptom of the problem. And yes, the work of Jesus encompasses addressing that problem. 
But the more central thing that he is addressing is a problem of sin. And this is where liberation theology goes wrong. So they, they have some good concerns, liberation theologians. They're rightly pointing out corruption. They're rightly pointing out a, a preferential treatment for the poor in Scripture. But they're just going too far with it. And they're seeing everything through that lens. When in reality, it's just a symptom of a greater problem. So we need to keep things in better perspective. Let me continue, however, with this article. It's very brief, but let me continue with it before we move forward. All forms of oppression, slavery, and injustice have their roots in personal sin. Liberation from personal sin is what eliminates those secondary effects. Liberation theology essentially focuses on the symptoms rather than the disease. Well said, Father. Here's another thing. It has tendencies towards Marxism, focus on class struggle rather than individual sin. Is there a phenomenon of class struggle? Generally, of course. But is that really the central theme of Scripture? God came to liberate us from class struggle? No. He came to liberate us from sin, bondage to sin, and bondage to Satan. To liberate us and unite us to himself and to elevate our nature, to unite us to Jesus Christ, to elevate us to the divine. What we would call theosis in the Eastern tradition. It has tendencies towards Marxism and tends to focus on systems rather than persons. But of course, systems are made up of persons, right? This branch of theology has also been used to justify violence. Authentic Christianity declares that Jesus Christ died for sin and offers us new life through grace. Liberation theology has a tendency to focus on reforming unjust, unearthly systems with only secondary regard for the sins of the individuals involved. Now, it's the other way around. Our primary focus is to help liberate people from sin. And yes, we can also address, and we should address, and we have a responsibility to address reforming unjust earthly systems. It's a both and. It's not an either or. It's a both and. But first things first. We have to keep our eyes on the sin problem and keep our eyes on things that have eternal consequences. Address those first, and then we can also address the things that have earthly and temporary consequences. It is no good to reform unjust earthly systems if we're not also reforming unjust sinful hearts. Why? Because in the case of the latter, there are eternal consequences. In the case of the former, there are temporal consequences. While it is certainly praiseworthy and holy to commit one's life to opposing injustice, we need to remember that Jesus died so that we might have eternal life, not just better access to social programs. What good are all the social programs in the world if we are still slaves to sin? Amen, Father. Preach. And how can those social programs not be abused by those who control them if they are still ruled by original sin? Oh, oh. Some in the liberation theology movement are underestimating the grip that original sin has on hold of the hearts of men. The church condemns injustice, oppression, and slavery. The church seeks to rouse the conscience of those who can affect change. The church preaches that we are commanded, not suggested, to love one another. But all these things must be done in accordance with the truth of the gospel. The idea that the Christian message is primarily focused on secular and economic matters is indeed heretical. But the idea that actually trying to help the poor through personal charity and creating just systems in society is indeed a moral obligation of Christians and is perfectly orthodox. Pope John Paul II and Benedict XVI often spoke of the need for a preferential option for the poor. Well said. Very balanced article. I appreciate that. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Very succinct summary. 
of what liberation theology is and what some of its problems are due to an imbalance. Okay, so now that we've established our terms, okay, we have to ask, is Pope Francis, therefore, a liberation theologian? That was the claim that we saw made by Ben Shapiro. And it's a claim that, frankly, I hear a lot of Catholics say. So again, it's not unique to Ben. Ben is merely on the outside looking in and seeing when he looks in that a lot of us Catholics are saying this. And unfortunately, due to our ignorance, we're misleading non-Christians. And how can we expect them to take the Catholic Church seriously and to really consider coming to the Catholic Church when we are poor witnesses to what is and is not true about the state of affairs in the Catholic Church. We're unintentionally scandalizing non-Christians, and we're unintentionally pushing them away from the Catholic Church. Don't just say, well, it's Pope Francis and his problems pushing people away. Whatever criticism you may offer, whatever damage Pope Francis is doing, we're heightening it. We're adding to it, and we're adding to the pushing people away factor whenever we get things wrong and inaccurately portray Pope Francis. Um, I want to first take a look at the response that Bishop Barron gave to Ben Shapiro to this very question a few years ago. Uh, in fact, four years ago. Ben Shapiro asked the same question, is Pope Francis a liberation theologian? To which Bishop Barron gave a good answer. And after that, I'm going to take a look at the words of Pope, um, Pope Francis himself. So we'll, we'll take a look at the primary sources, if you will. Uh, we'll see what Pope Francis personally says about liberation and theology and Marxism. But first, I want to start out with the answer that has already been provided to Ben Shapiro on this question. All right, let me share my screen. All right, you should be able to see it now. Let's begin. The critique that's been made by a lot of folks that he is a devotee of liberation theology. Because I, I, no, I think that's that's almost demonstrably false. Because at a certain point in his development, uh, I mean, he knew the liberation theology movement and turned against it. It's more of a, a populism, I would say. It was not the embrace of the Marxist option. He was very influenced by a Frenchman called Gaston Fassard, who was a mid-century French Jesuit, sharply critical of Marx and of Marxism. Um, and so I think Bergoglio uh, consciously departs from liberation theology, opts for a different path. It's, it's more of a populism. It's an embrace of popular piety. It's an embrace of, of kind of the people. Now, not in the Marxist sense of the term, but more in this Latin American sense. Um, so I think it's, he's demonstrably not with liberation theology. Well, the media have been obviously. Okay, so that is the answer that was provided to him already. I think it was definitely a sufficient answer that Bishop Baring gave. I can certainly say when I look at Pope Francis, he says some things that emphasizes our need to take care of the poor, some themes that you can find in liberation theology, but those are not unique to what liberation theology actually is. Those are just themes you can find in the Bible. There is going to be some overlap here because some of the things that liberations theologians latch onto is biblical. This is kind of the problem with theological errors. They latch onto some good things, some truths. They just kind of go too far with it. Think of your Christological heresies. They latch onto some truths, but they generally tend to be half truths. Jesus is fully man. Yes, amen. Absolutely, he is fully man. But some will say, but he's only fully man. <laughs> he's not also fully God. Ah, okay, now we have an issue. I don't have an issue with you saying he's fully man. I have you an issue with you saying he's only fully man, right? He's fully God, fully man, and one person. Uh, people saying something like, um, Jesus is fully divine, but he's not actually fully human. That was just an appearance. Docetism, as it's called. Yeah, no, <laughs> he's, he's also fully man. There, that incarnation thing really actually did happen, right? And there's a reason why it happened. 
Um, so what happens with theological errors is people latch on to some truths, but they just run with it and go too far and they are unbalanced and they're not balancing it with other things. And that's what happens here. So if now Pope Francis says anything good about the poor or uses some good language that a liberation theologian might use, maybe uses some good elements found in liberation theology, people will say, well, see, he's a liberation theologian. No, no, he, he's, he can certainly appeal to the good found in it, but then he is also going to critique it elsewhere, and he has. Let me give you one example among many. Uh, here is an interview that Pope Francis uh, offered where he explicitly, explicitly critiques liberation theology and Marxism. So you can't say he is a Marxist or a liberation theologian when he explicitly, explicitly critiques both of those concepts, right? Unless you're just going to say he's just being dishonest, to which you would have to say you're going to, well, to which I would say, you really need to d demonstrate that and prove that. Otherwise, that is a rash accusation, and it could certainly be sinful in nature if if there's not enough to morally establish that, which there isn't, by the way. Um, so let me share my screen, and you can kind of see this in the interview that he offered here. Uh, this one is found on Fox News, uh, July 2nd, 2022. Um, and here is ground zero. Here's the quote. Pope Francis says, quote, There have been attempts of ideologization, such as the use of Marxist concepts in the analysis of reality by liberation theology. That was an ideological exploitation, a path of liberation, let's say, of the Latin American popular church. But there is a difference between the people and populism, the Pope said. And I'll put a link to it, and you're welcome to go and read the whole thing. But obviously, he's trying to balance this issue out. Marxism and liberation theology, it's a no for Pope Francis. It's an it's a epic no. It might have some things, and again, liberation theology might have some things that are true and good and accurate, but not because they come from liberation theology, but actually because they come from scripture. It's just liberation theologians are abusing things when they began to insert and interpret everything through a Marxist lens. Pope Francis does not accept that. Period. Um, let me go also to the comment that Ben Shapiro said about schism, because that's especially what I wanted to focus on here. I'm going to bring it up on my screen so you can see it again. Mm -hmm. There it is. Mm, I don't think you can see that. Hold on. There. There. You can see it better now. Okay, so Shapiro says, and Catholics all over the world are very aware of the schism Pope Francis has now created within the Catholic Church because of his many overtures on social redistributionism and climate change. Well, there is a lot going on here. In a second, I want to tackle the question, can the Pope cause a schism? Are we accurately understanding the term schism here when we make this statement? And number two, for those who are concerned that the Pope has initiated a schism, is it because of these two things, social redistributionism and climate change? Well, I'll tell you this. As one of those who was a critic of Pope Francis, a very strong critic of Pope Francis, and also knowing all of the key figures who are critics of Pope Francis, either personally or just a knowledge of their work, I can tell you that is not what most people who are Catholics believe is initiating a schism in the Catholic Church. So the critics of Pope Francis who are saying, Pope Francis, you're causing a schism in the Catholic Church, 
I could tell you right now, it's not that they believe this is because of his comments on climate change. They might have criticisms of those things. Sure. But I can tell you right now, they're not saying it's because of his comments on climate change or social redistributionism that is causing a schism in the Catholic Church. I'll tell you right now what they're saying is causing a schism in the Catholic Church. On a general level, they believe Pope Francis is abandoning sacred tradition, the deposit of faith, the faith itself, Catholic faith. Um, specifically, they also believe he is attacking one expression of its liturgy. Um, and they believe that is also an attack on sacred tradition. And then number three, and probably most central for the people who are making this claim, is they believe Pope Francis is changing doctrine specifically on questions of sexual immorality. Specifically. On questions of sexual immorality. Um, and, and, and some might walk that back a little bit and say, well, no, he's not changing doctrine, but what he's doing is he's introducing or allowing or tolerating disciplines that are in violation of these doctrines. So you'll, you'll find some, some differences among this group there. But that's generally what they're saying. So I can tell you right now, whoever is advising Ben Shapiro is severely misinformed. Um, or whatever research Ben Shapiro has done, it is severely incomplete. Um, and again, I can't fault Shapiro as much as I fault Catholics who have led him to this position. Um, if we can't get it right, I don't expect non-Christians to get it right. If we're dealing with Catholics in the Catholic Church who are severely misguided in this area, I I don't I don't I expect less than from a non-Christian. Because I, I, I hold Catholics to a higher standard. In fact, the Catholics that I hold to the highest standard are your traditionalists. You know why I hold them to a higher standard than anybody else? Your liberals and progressives and all that. You know why I hold the traditionalists to the highest standard in the Catholic Church? Because they have the most truth. They have the most light. The most has been given to them. And so they're responsible for knowing more. They're in a position where they're expected to know more. I don't really, I, I don't expect much from the progressives. I don't. I don't. I have a very low estimation of their knowledge of church history and theology. I, I don't expect much from them. But I expect much more from the traditionalists. And unfortunately, the criticisms that have led to people like Ben Shapiro having this misinformation and wrong perspective is coming more from the traditionalists than it is from anyone else. So again, if we get it wrong, I expect non-Christians to get it wrong. So I'm not really blaming Ben, ben Shapiro as much as I'm not saying he's free from all culpability and isn't responsible for the things he says or something, but I understand why he says this. Us Catholics, we're, we're saying this. It's, it's kind of like the Orthodox that I talk to. I understand why they say Pope Francis is an idolater. He worships the Pachamama. I understand why they say that, because there's Catholics who are saying that. Now, I've done entire shows already addressing the issue of Pachamama. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But I don't expect non-Christians or even non-Catholics to get it right on those questions when Catholics aren't. That's my point. Um, so already at the outset, regardless of your position on whether or not the Pope can cause a schism, if you take the position that he can, we have to say, well, Ben is mistaken here because that's not really what Catholics who believe Pope Francis is initiating the schism. This is not really what they believe is initiating the schism. They believe the synod on synodality and reevaluating sexual questions. They believe that is what initiates a schism. Now, I think they have a distorted understanding of the Synod of Synodality and what's actually being addressed and discussed and what the Synod can and cannot do. Again, I've done videos on that, but I'm just trying to give you 
an accurate understanding of where the radical traditionalists or um, some who are not radical traditionalists, they're just simply traditionalists, but they have these same concerns that Pope Francis is initiating a schism. I'm just trying to tell you where they're coming from. It's not from a climate change perspective. It's not from a social redistributionism perspective, though they may critique those things. Okay, so now we also need to examine the question, can the Pope actually, from the Catholic perspective, initiate a schism? Now, for somebody who is not a Christian, um, such as Ben Shapiro, I, I expect him to believe that the Pope can initiate a schism because he doesn't hold to Vatican I or the Code of Canon Law or the Gospel of Matthew. I understand why a non-Christian would say this. From the outside looking in, if you don't believe in certain divine promises, of course you're going to think it's possible for the Pope to initiate a schism. Um, however, those Catholics who are saying this are severely misguided in their ecclesiology. Severely misguided. Um, according to a Catholic ecclesiology, it is contradictory it is incoherent conceptually to speak of the Pope causing a schism in the Catholic Church. That's a contradiction in terms and concepts. It's incoherent. And here's why. Um, because according to the Code of Canon Law, for one, schism is defined as the refusal of submission to the Pope or of communion with the members of the church subject to him. Schism is to depart from the Pope. So to talk about the Pope causing a schism is an internally contradictory concept because those who are in schism are those who are in opposition to the papacy and not in communion with them. So where the Pope is going with his magisterium, where the Pope is going, those who are surrounded with the Pope are not in schism. Those who break away from him are, however. So it's impossible to talk about the Pope initiating a schism, not only because of this internal inconsistency with what the concept is, but also because of divine promises that are made for the papacy, which again, I expect somebody who's not a Christian like Ben Shapiro, to not believe in those divine promises. I, I get it. I totally get it. But I do expect Catholics to believe in those divine promises. And that's why I hold Catholics to a higher standard, especially ones who are traditional. You're held to a higher standard because you have more responsibility to um, expound and deliver the Catholic faith. Let me go to the First Vatican Council among many places that we could go to here to express this concept of a divine, divine promise that guarantees unity in the Catholic Church and prevents schism. Vatican I says this, and this is authoritative. This is the magisterium. This isn't optional. If we're Catholics and we're not Protestants, you don't get to say, I don't care what the magisterium says. I'm going to go with my opinion, or I'm going to go with my interpretation of what a church father said, or what my interpretation of what a council said. You don't get to go with your interpretation over and against the magisterium's interpretation. Because if you do that, as soon as you do that, you've become Protestant in nature at the core, because that's what the Protestants were doing. Martin Luther was not abandoning church fathers. He was just interpreting them in a certain way. Same for John Calvin. Calvin really thought that he was holding to the church fathers. He just would interpret them in a way that contradicted how the magisterium understood the fathers. All right, so we, we don't have license as Catholics to descend from this. The gift of truth and never failing faith was therefore divinely conferred on Peter. This is a gift to Peter and his successors in this sea, that is Rome's sea. It's a gift from God, a gift that is a never-failing faith divinely conferred on Peter and his successors, the popes. Can a divine gift fail? No. Now, what purpose does this gift serve? Does it just serve for a pope to speak ex-cathedra in rare 
rare and limited circumstances and to be free from error in those circumstances? No, no. The gift is broader than that. What is the gift for? So that they might discharge their exalted office for the salvation of all, and so that the whole flock of Christ might be kept away from the poisonous food of air and be nourished with the sustenance of heavenly doctrine. Thus, the tendency to schism is removed. Full stop. There is a divine promise according to Vatican I. A divine promise that removes the tendency to schism because of the papacy. So it's internally contradictory, conceptually and by divine faith, to say that the papacy causes a schism. The Pope, Pope Francis is causing a schism. Well, you've departed from Vatican I at that point. Thus, the tendency to schism is removed. And the whole church is preserved in unity and resting on its foundation can stand firm against the gates of hell. But people are saying Pope Francis, who's causing a schism, they cannot say what Vatican I is saying here. They would say, no, it's not being preserved in unity. He's causing a schism. It's not resting on its foundation. He's dislodging it from its foundation. And he's not standing firm against the gates of hell. They're, they're explicitly contradicting Vatican I. And unfortunately, when they begin to connect the dots and say, well, you know what? Vatican I says this, but then I believe Pope Francis is causing a schism. You know where that leads them? It leads them to conclude Pope Francis isn't the Pope. And isn't that exactly what we're seeing now? Priests, bishops, archbishops becoming set of a contests, saying that Pope Francis isn't the Pope and the Sea of St. Peter is empty. Yes, that's what we're seeing because people are starting to connect the dots and say, you know what? Vatican I can't be true if my opinion about Pope Francis is true. And rather than reevaluating their wrong opinion about Pope Francis, they just take their opinion about Pope Francis as gospel truth and they say, well, that violates Vatican I. And instead of retracing their steps, they just say, well, therefore, Pope Francis can't be the Pope. Also, in the pre previous per paragraph, it says, For the Holy Spirit was promised to the successors of Peter, not so that they might, make, by his revelation, make known some new doctrine, but by his assistance they might religiously guard and faithfully expound the revelation or deposit of faith transmitted by the apostles. So the Holy Spirit is helping the Pope in his magisterium and through a assistance of the Holy Spirit, even in non-infallible teachings, there's a general assistance of the Holy Spirit to guard and expound the deposit of faith. Indeed, their apostolic teaching was embraced by all venerable fathers, that is, of the popes, and reverenced and followed by all holy orthodox doctors, for they knew very well that this see of St. Peter always remains unblemished by any ear. This is a quote from uh, the Sixth Ecumenical Council. So this isn't new. This is from one of our ecumenical councils. The see of St. Peter always remains unblemished by any air. But now, how is that true if the Pope is causing a schism? Huh. I'm seeing a contradiction here. Always remains unblemished by any air in accordance with the divine promise of our Lord. So this isn't based on some human tradition. This is a divine promise. Which the Savior made to the prince of his disciples, Peter. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. But isn't a schismatic pope, a pope causing a schism? Hasn't his faith failed? Isn't he causing turmoil in the church? Isn't he blemishing the See of St. Peter? And again, everything in paragraph 7, he'd be guilty of violating all of these things. The opposite of paragraph 7 would be true. So you can't, as a Catholic, hold to this concept that you find there Vatican I, which is not new to Vatican I. It's expressing the faith of the church throughout the ages. So you can't just say, well, Vatican I's wrong, as odd as that claim would be for a Catholic to make, and as problematic as that would be for a Catholic to make. It's not just Vatican I. Vatican I is expressing and summarizing a very long, long, long tradition going back all the way to the sacred scriptures. Um, so I would also say that 
about the question of Pope Francis causing a schism. Lastly, let me address the comments that Ben Shapiro made about Pope Francis in regard to climate change. Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of ignorance here on part of Catholics who have misguided non-Christians such as Ben Shapiro on the question. I did a video just a couple days ago. I'll put a link to it in the show notes on the question of can Pope Francis comment on or can the Pope comment on matters of science, you know, global warming, climate change. Um, you know, there are some people who say, no, the Pope can't comment on questions of science. That's outside of his scope. All he could do is speak about faith and morals. <laughs> It's, it's not that simple, though, right? I mean, I, I, maybe it would be nice if it were that simple. But unfortunately, it's not that simple because those two things, you know, one category is faith and morals and the other category is science. Those two things have some overlap because there are some implications, moral implications of certain questions of science. There are also some implications of faith with some questions of science. So insofar as a question of science relates to or impacts a matter of faith and morals, the Pope can comment and teach and bind consciences on such matters. But it is also a little more complex than that. I'll summarize it as follows. Yes, the Pope can teach on matters of science insofar as it relates to faith and morals, and he can bind our consciences on questions of science insofar as they relate to faith and morals. Um, but the Pope is not a scientist, right? I mean, I don't know of any Pope who has had you know, formal training in the sciences and natural sciences, maybe, maybe some did, but you know, our, our current Pope does not have any, you know, postgraduate uh, expertise in any of the natural sciences. Uh, so our current Pope cannot speak as a scientist. If he speaks about science, he can only rely on the authorities who are in science. He cannot speak as a scientist per se, because He's not an authority on matters of science. He has to listen to what the scientists say. And based on what they're saying, he can then compare that to faith and morals. And then he can make a judgment on whether or not this impacts the faith, and if so, how. And he can teach his flock accordingly. And that is binding on our consciences. However, however, and there's a big however here. What if the Pope is relying on a question of science and he's, he's relying on the experts in science? And what if the experts are wrong? Well, when the Pope evaluates that question of science, he's not in a position to say that the science scientists are wrong. He's not in that position. He has to take them at their word. Um, and so the judgment that he makes about and the analysis that he makes about that question of science, the principles that he uses to judge it by, the moral and faith principles that he uses to judge that question by, are generally true, right? I mean, the, the questions of morality that he's you know, engaging in, those are true. But his ultimate conclusion about that particular matter of science would be inaccurate not because of the faith and morals that he's drawing from and those principles, but because the factual information that he has been given is actually inaccurate and is not factually true. So what the Pope is generally saying, the general expression of morality that he's pointing to would be true, but the actual conclusion and specific evaluation of the matter at hand would actually be inaccurate. So let, let me give you an example. The proposition that uh, global warming is caused by humans. Well, um, what the Pope can do is he can evaluate that question um, and its, um, you know, its implications on morality. 
but he has to take the proposition for granted. If the experts in science are saying, yeah, that's the case, he has to take it for granted because he's in no position to contest what the scientists are saying because he's not a scientist. And so the evaluation that he makes here is generally speaking binding on one's conscience insofar as they relate to faith and morals, not so insofar as the science is concerned, but insofar as the question of faith and morals is concerned and how this question impacts faith and morals, that's binding. But it all does hinge on the question of, well, is the proposition true, right? What if the proposition turns out to be false? Well, we as Catholics do have the right, according to the magisterium, to question whether or not those scientific propositions are true. And thus, we do have the ability to question the theological conclusions of the Pope on the basis that we're questioning the premises that he is adopting whenever he comes to that conclusion. Donum Veritatis speaks about this. It's a document issued by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And it talks about the parameters of how we are to do this. So though generally speaking, the Pope and what he teaches on faith and morals is binding on our consciences. If we have very good reason, after a great amount of study, if we have very good reason to believe that what the Pope is saying about a particular matter of science and what he's saying about it insofar as it relates to faith and morals, if we have very good reason to believe that matter of science is faulty, then we can contest and question the conclusion of the Pope. And we can do so in good faith, according to the magisterium itself, Donum Veritatis, approved by the Pope. That is part of the magisterium. So the magisterium itself does recognize there is some wiggle room here. Insofar as we're questioning the premises that ultimately derive from science that the Pope is relying on in his conclusions. Well, insofar as we're questioning those things and we have good reason to question them, there's no real dissent at place here if we withhold assent in, in, um, from those conclusions. Um, but it's, it's a, you know... It's not something very easy to do because how many of us are in a position to really question matters of science, right? Um, not saying that we can't. I'm just saying how many of us are really in that position? How many of us are very well informed about questions of science so that we could contest maybe perhaps a, a consensus among the scientists? Perhaps some of us are in that position, um, but perhaps many of us are not, and it would be rash for us to just immediately jump to the conclusion, the science is wrong. Mm, maybe the science is wrong. But are you really in the position to make that judgment? Well, um, ultimately, that's going to be um, something you're going to have to determine for yourself. But as the German bishop said, I think in 68 or 67, um, when you start going down that direction, just know that you're ultimately going to give an account to God and you'll be responsible for your conclusions. And so just make sure you, you got your ducks in a row and you're, and you're right here. So I don't want to go to one extreme to summarize all of this. I don't want to go to one extreme and say, well, the Pope can't comment on questions of climate change or global warming or this and that. Yes, he can. In the exact same way, the magisterium can teach on in vitro fertilization. Right? If you say... The Pope can't comment on global change. You've just undercut the church's ability to comment on other questions like in vitro fertilization, among others. However, I don't want to go to the other extreme and then say, well, just because he can teach on these questions and just because they are generally binding, that somehow means that his analysis is infallible or that somehow means that there's no possible way I could contest what the Pope is saying. And there's no possible way that I could withhold assent from what he's teaching. I don't want to go to that other extreme because Donum Veritatis guards against that other extreme. Both of those extremes are false. The Pope can't comment on um, global warming, uh, climate change. Pope can't comment on those things. No. 
No, you're, you're wrong. He can't. Uh, because it can relate to a matter of the deposit of faith. And insofar as it relates to the deposit of faith, by way of a secondary object of teaching, he can. What we have, what we have in, in magisterial studies is two concepts. The, when it comes to the object of teaching authority, like what is within the scope of being taught, you have primary objects, those things that directly relate to what God has revealed. And then you have secondary objects, those things that God didn't, strictly speaking, reveal it, but it relates to something revealed by God, either logically or historically. Um, and insofar as something relates to a matter of faith and morals, the magisterium, including the Pope, can teach on it. It's called a secondary object. And in fact, it is also an object of infallibility. The magisterium could teach infallibly on such questions. Um, so I don't want to go to that extreme, but I also don't want to go to the other extreme. Well, just because the Pope said this about climate change, it therefore must be true, and there's no way I can contest it. No, th there's a middle position here. Your general disposition is going to be one of assent. Your general disposition needs to be when the Pope says something about you know, climate change or just, just whatever, anything related to science. The general disposition is insofar as it relates to faith and morals, I need to be ready to assent to what he says. But if there are good reasons to believe that the information that he has been given scientifically is inaccurate, I can withhold assent in limited cases. And I can do so respectfully, lovingly, and I can do so charitably, uh, e even critiquing uh, what the Pope has said. Charitably, lovingly, with respect for his office. All of that is laid out in Donum Veritatis. So let's avoid both of those extremes. And if we do that, we might be in a better position to inform non-Christians, such as Ben Shapiro, on these questions in the future. And that might help prepare them to embrace the fullness of the faith found in the Catholic Church, rather than unintentionally pushing them further away because we ourselves don't understand the magisterium, we ourselves don't understand ecclesiology very well, and we ourselves don't understand the situation with Pope Francis very well. If we're ignorant, we're going to end up unintentionally misleading the non-Christians, and that will often push them further away. Because believe me, there are plenty of reasons and plenty of problems in the Catholic Church Plenty, plenty of concerns that people are already going to have that are pushing them away. The Catholic Church, unfortunately, we're doing some things that already is pushing some people away. With scandals and whatnot, we already have enough problems. We don't need to add to that factor and push people even further away with misinformation due to our ignorance. We need to be better catechized, learn more about our faith, especially in the area of ecclesiology. If we as Catholics knew ecclesiology better, a lot of these problems would disappear overnight. Because most of these problems that I'm seeing go back to just that. Well, hopefully this was helpful. Uh, hey, who knows? Maybe the Daily Wire will check this out and Ben Shapiro will watch it and appreciate it. I certainly did so um, offered this uh, pushback in a spirit of charity and respect to Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire. Like I said, Love those guys. I think they do a lot of great work. I don't agree with everything they say, obviously. I definitely um, have some questions about what they're saying about Pope Francis. Um, and so I wanted to offer this, uh, this criticism, though I wanted to do so in a very respectful way, giving them props for all the good work that they've done, which I have noted here on the channel many times. I, I support a lot of what they're doing. A perfect example is what Matt Walsh is doing with the question of what is a woman. I support a great deal of the work he is doing there and uh, among others. And so I want to give credit to where credit is due, but I also wanted to offer some charitable um, pushback on some misinformation that I'm seeing here that I think should be corrected in, in the spirit of charity, um, in the spirit of love, um, in, a, in a spirit of pursuing truth.
So hopefully this was helpful. If it was, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and comment there in the comment section. That will help me grow this channel, and it will also help reach more people. So if you felt like this video was a message that you want people to benefit from, please do your part. Hit the like button, comment, and especially subscribe. Also hit the bell for notifications so you know when I go live because I tend to go live out of nowhere. Uh, so definitely do that. Also check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you want to support me, this is my livelihood. This is how I take care of my family. So if you think this is a beneficial way for me to support my family, you want to see more of this content, please support me at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology or the donate link that I'm going to put there in the show notes. You can go and support me directly at the donate link or the PayPal link. I also put a PayPal link in there if you would rather use them. All right, that's going to do it. We'll see you later. God bless. Hey, everybody just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the church, but you see that there's a crisis in the church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. ReasonInTheology.com Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.